OK, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, I will present you the study where we analyze the role of business culture and honest behavior in the banking industry. And this is joint work with my colleague, Alan Cohn, who's at the University of Chicago, and Ernst Fair, who's also at the Department of Economics, uh, University of Zurich. So just to get a broader uh, picture, um, this study is part of a larger uh, research agenda that I started together with Alan Cohn uh, a couple of years ago. And the goal of this agenda is basically to study the economic, social, and also biological determinants of honest uh, behavior. And we use a, a multitude of approaches. So we have more traditional type of lab experiments where um, people make decisions in a very controlled environment. But we also have, uh, are, are doing field studies around the world to measure the level of honesty in different uh, countries and, and regions. And we also uh, invest, use neuroscientific methods to study, especially brain stimulation, to study uh, the biology of, of uh, honest uh, behavior. So we got interested into the uh, banking industry because of the recent accumulation of, of, of scandals uh, in the banking industry. And these uh, scandals created a large amount of economic damage. So for example, uh, the two rogue traders or, or lead, who are leading the Hall of Fame of uh, uh, rogue traders, Jerome Carviel and Kweko Adoboli, um, for instance, in 2007, uh, Jerome Carviel caused a damage of uh, 6.7 billion uh, to Société Générale, uh, which corresponds roughly to the GDP of uh, Liechtenstein. And uh, Queco Adoboli caused uh, $2.3 billion damage to UBS and also caused the formal, uh, former CEO Oswald Grübel to step down uh, from his uh, office. But these are certainly some extreme cases, but other scandals show that this is not just a phenomenon of one or two uh, individuals. Think of the LIBOR scandal or tax evasion affairs. Um, that show that dishonest behavior is uh, also involves uh, business, entire business units or even the cooperation of uh, employees between different uh, banks. So as a can consequence of these scandals, the image of the banking industry has uh, dramatically suffered in the last uh, couple of years. So we've run a, a, a known uh, survey study um, <clears throat> with the general population and ask them to guess uh, the amount of cheating in different populations or subgroups and the general population in a specific experimental task that we used actually also in this study we will see later. So <clears throat> as you can see here um, some of them were asked what do you think how often do doctors cheat and uh, here in this experiment, and they sh show that the, the public generally thinks that doctors are quite honest, cheat in less than 10% uh, of the cases. In terms of the general population, it's uh, the population at large, they think that the general population is much more dishonest than, uh, let's say, the doctors. And not surprisingly, they think that the prisoners are more dishonest than uh, the general population. But what really struck us was uh, the fact that they even slightly think that the, the bankers are more uh, dishonest than uh, the prison inmates. Now, this has not always been the case. Um, <clears throat> historically, bankers had a much better image and enjoyed a high social uh, status. Um, this uh, historical survey from the U.S. Gallup poll, uh, they asked people um, <coughs> uh, whether they rate, how they rate the ethical standards of, of bank employees. And uh, here is the percentage of people who say that uh, they have very low or low honesty in, uh, uh, in, in uh, bank employees. And as you can see, it's, uh, this percentage was around, uh, fluctuated around 12% in the earlier days. But with the rise of the, uh, with the financial crisis, uh, this uh, reached uh, historical uh, record uh, highs. So 
So experts and uh, policymakers often argued that banks have a cultural problem. Uh, in other words, that the occupational norms and, and the unwritten rules of behavior implicitly favor or tolerate uh, dishonest behavior. So for instance, Adair Turner, uh, who was the former uh, chairman of the British Financial Service Authority, uh, said that bank ex executives face the challenge of setting clearly from the top a culture which tells people that there are things they shouldn't do even if they are legal and even if they are profitable and even if it's highly likely that the supervisor will never spot them. Similar concerns have also been raised by, by industry insiders. So take, for example, Jerome Carviel, who excuses his behavior with the, the, with the prevailing culture of the trading uh, room. So he says that the culture of the trading room was to make as much money as possible as quickly as possible. And clearly, I let myself enter a spiral in large part because my superiors, seeing the money come in, did not stop encouraging me. And similarly, uh, Greg Smith, who's the author of the book Why I Left uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, says, I've worked here long enough to understand the trajectory of its culture, its people, and its identity. And I can honestly say that the environment now is as toxic and destructive as I've ever seen it. But so far, there no, was no scientific evidence that kind of supports this hypothesis that the, there is a, uh, these cases of dishonest behavior are also related to, to the culture that, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in those uh, uh, organizations. And we wanted to fill this gap and analyze whether the culture in the banking industry implicitly favors uh, uh, dishonest behavior. Now, this is not an easy task um, because measuring the causal influence of business culture um, is, is, is difficult because of, uh, you cannot simply compare uh, two uh, different members of different occupations. Because, let's say, for example, you compare doctors with uh, bank employees. And if you would see, for example, that the bank employees uh, behave more dishonest than the medical doctors, we would not know whether this is the business culture that renders the bank employees more dishonest or simply whether more dishonest people are more likely to work in the banking industry rather than in, in medicine. So there's a, a, the difficulty is to disentangle the cultural effect from this type of selection effects or occupational choice effects. So this is why we opted uh, for a different approach that is based on uh, the economics of uh, or the economic theory of identity that was pioneered by the Nobel laureate George Akerlof and Rachel Cranton. And according to this theory, people have multiple identities and or roles, such as their gender, their race, or their profession, or their role as a as a family member. Now, each of these roles is tied to a specific set of norms that prescribe people how to behave in uh, uh, different situations. Now, the question is, uh, which role more strongly influences behavior depends on how salient uh, a specific identity is at, at a specific point in time. Uh, in a given situation. So this depends strongly on the context. So while you're at work, your identity, as your professional identity or your role or your professional role is more salient, more top of your mind and therefore is more likely to guide your behavior than when you're at home with your family and your, your family identity as a family member is uh, uh, more salient. So for example, at home it seems perfectly okay to sit in your jogging pants, uh, but it would be inappropriate to, uh, to uh, wear jogging pants at, at work. For, this is an example of how the context shapes or uh, influences uh, the, the, beha the expected behavior. So if the banking culture implicitly favors dishonest behavior, 
it should be possible to trigger dishonest behavior by simply rendering the employees or bank employees professional or occupational role more salient by putting it more top of their minds. And this is uh, what we did in our experiment. So for our experiment, we collaborated with uh, a large international uh, bank. So we had 128 employees from this bank. We also have uh, another 80 employees from other uh, banks. So it's not just one bank. And the results are not significantly different between the two uh, uh, groups. So, but for, for simplicity, I present here only the data from, the, from these 128 uh, bank employees. 50, roughly 50% 50 of them work in the core business units. So they are private bankers, asset managers, traders or investment uh, managers. And another 50% worked in support units like risk or human resource management, IT, etc. So it's a quite diverse set of, uh, of employees and they also come from all uh, different uh, levels. They have, uh, on average, uh, work experience in the banking industry that's roughly 11.5 years, so substantial amount of uh, experience. Now, they, they were invited for an online uh, survey, and in order to disguise the, the purpose of the study, uh, the f yes? What was it? In Switzerland, or in Europe, or US? Um, we cannot reveal, uh, so we are in contact with many uh, banks um, due to these research questions, and, uh, but we cannot, uh, we, one of them agreed to participate here, so we cannot really uh, reveal the location or the identity of, of the bank, so this was part of the... Could be. <laughs> But, is it but it's an it's it's an, a, a large international bank, so it's still some someone who's relevant in the international in the employees or just from one country. So I, I cannot uh, reveal more information on on, on this. I'm just asking for cultural basis, or do you control for that? So we have uh, people who so we offered the survey in two languages, and uh, so um, we have a multi. So, so there's an international. Um, uh, commu uh, the people are international. <coughs> so in order to disguise the, the purpose of the study, the first part of the survey consisted of filler questions about subjective well-being and a couple of other things. And after, the fi after these filler questions, we split up the subjects randomly into two groups. So 50% of the subjects were uh, assigned to the professional identity condition. And so they were asked seven questions about their professional background. So at which bank are you presently employed? What is your function at this bank? For how many years have you been working in the banking industry? And so on. So the purpose of these questions was to, uh, to remind them of their occupational role and to render their occupational role more salient in their minds. The other 50% um, had questions that were unrelated to their occupational uh, background. So mostly questions about their leisure time. So they were asked, what is your favorite leisure activity? For how many, uh, how many hours per week uh, on average do you watch TV? And so on. So the only difference were these uh, seven uh, questions between the two subjects uh, pools and because they were randomly assigned we can directly um, infer that the difference in behavior must be uh, caused by, by, one, by, by these questions. So this method is also called, is called priming and has been used in, uh, in mostly in social psychology but also in economics more recently. And <clears throat> For instance, also in a, in a previous study that I conducted myself together with uh, Alan Cohn and Thomas Knoll, um, we were able to, we, we did this ex uh, similar experiment with maximum security prisoners and we were able to show that reminding them of their role as criminals um, uh, increases uh, their cheating behavior. So immediately after um, so after these questions, 
they uh, received the instructions, all participants received the instructions for the following coin tossing task where they could win money. So they had to take any coin and flip it 10 times and then they had to indicate the outcome of the coin flip and we determine in advance, so they knew in advance which, coin which result would yield them uh, 20 US dollars. So for instance in this case they received 20 US dollars if they flipped tails and 0 US dollars if they um, flipped heads. So in total they could earn up to 200 uh, US dollars. So this game has the advantage that it's quite unobtrusive because we cannot say with certainty whether someone cheated or not because we don't observe them while they are flipping the coins but uh, simple uh, what we know is that in a large group there should be roughly 50% of uh, coin flips that are won and 50% of coin flips that are lost. So we know the distribution that should result if people would have behaved on it in, in, in this sample. So in other studies we use this task now in our research uh, with uh, many kinds of uh, populations and, and situations and <coughs> we were able to show for example in this experiment with the prisoners that I mentioned to you that the people who are more successful in this uh, coin flipping task in prison also have a larger number of disciplinary offenses like for instance illegal uh, alcohol or drug uh, possession or uh, aggression against other inmates etc. Or we have done it with um, students, uh, high school students students and we are able to show that this correlates with misbehavior in, in the class, for instance unexcused absences or um, not doing your homework or disturbing the class. So it suggests that this task really gives us a good, is a good proxy for, uh, for, for rule violating uh, behavior. Did the employees effectively get the cash or was it just... Like yes. So we paid out, uh, so they knew in advance that every fifth subject would actually be paid out according to their decisions. So they could really win uh, this, this money. So this is the standard in experimental economics that you incentivize behavior uh, with uh, real money. From the setup, did they know that it was a test to check their honesty? No. What was the, what was the topic that were given? It was Why just... For the study. For this study, it was a study on um, uh, sa life satisfaction in, in different uh, uh, companies. So that was the main topic, and then this was at the end of it. It's kind of a game of luck, where you ca could win money as a thank you for your participation. Now we also introduced a competitive uh, uh, element here because we did not, uh, the subjects were only paid out if the earnings uh, they reported in this outcome was greater or equal to the outcome of a randomly drawn subject from a pilot study. So this creates some competitive pressure and we thought that this is an element that uh, might be important uh, to have here. So let us now look at the results. First I want to show you that uh, we, we had a test, a manipulation check to see whether the, the, these questions really worked as intended. So how did we, we do this? So we wanted to know whether these banking questions make the bank employees uh, occupational role more salient. And <clears throat> for this purpose after they answered these questions, the occupational questions or the the leisure questions, they had to com uh, complete this, uh, do this word completion task uh, which gives us a, an implicit measure of let's say how much they think about bank related uh, concepts. So as you can see they had to complete these words here for instance take the first one which can be completed with stock or clock so some of the words have a connotation with the with the banking industry or the, or the financial industry and some not so here broker smoker money honey bond or band so the idea was to see whether those people who were asked those questions about their occupational background really thought more about uh, these uh, bank related uh, concepts so here are the results from this manipulation check. 
Uh, in the control condition, roughly 25% of the subject mentioned uh, used bank-related words to complete this, uh, this uh, word completion task or this quiz. And this goes uh, up to um, 35, nearly 35% uh, uh, in the uh, banker identity condition, and this is statistically uh, significant, suggesting that the priming questions worked as intended and really manipulated the mental accessibility of bank-related uh, thoughts. So now let us turn to the most interesting part, namely the effect on uh, honesty or, or, or dishonest behavior. So these are now the results from the control group. So these are the people who answered the control question about their leisure time. What you can see from this graph is that they behaved honest. So in blue we have the distribution of coin flips or earnings uh, that you would expect if everyone would be telling the truth. So for instance you would expect that roughly 25% of the subjects have exactly uh, earnings of 100 uh, US dollars. You would expect that less than 1% of the subjects earns 200 US dollars. And what you can see is that the two distributions uh, they, they are nearly indistinguishable except here for some guys who are a little bit too lucky but uh, in general you can see the two uh, overlap uh, quite nicely so suggesting that the bank employees in the control condition behaved honest so we can actually use simple uh, probability theory to compute the fraction of misreported coin flips and uh, this amounts to, or the cheating rate, this amounts to 3% in this uh, control condition. So this stands in complete contrast to the public perception that I've shown you at the, at the, at the beginning, that where everyone thought that bank employees are, are even more dishonest than, than, than prisoners. And it also speaks, uh, I would say, against the idea that uh, more dishonest people are, are likely to uh, select into the, the banking industry. So now the interesting question is, how does this behavior change when uh, they are put into their uh, occupational uh, mindset? So this we see in the second graph, and you can clearly see here that now, the, again, in blue you have the distribution that you would expect and in red is the actual distribution and you can see that the distribution is shifted out towards uh, higher earnings. So we have here uh, too many uh, people who have uh, uh, or claim higher earnings and too few people who claim uh, low earnings. And this difference is statistically uh, significant. And uh, the cheating rate here goes up to 16% uh, uh, of misreported uh, coin flips. So these results suggest that the bank employees' compliance with the honesty norm is undermined when their occupational role uh, is made uh, more salient. Now we also looked at the two different, I mentioned that we have 50% of subjects in the core business unit and 50% in the support unit. And so here's just another way, uh, here's the sample split up by core units, by the units, but here you have to take this, uh, consider this more carefully because this is, now we split up the sample so we have, in, we have a, a lower number of observations in general. But what you can see is the 50% benchmark, so you would expect that 50% of the people win in the support unit, so you see they're honest in the control condition and they go up here. And what you can see is that the people in general, if you compare the control condition, people who have worked in the core units behaved more dishonest than the people in the support units. But what's interesting is in both groups we find a similar effect when they are thinking about uh, their occupational role, suggesting that uh, this cultural effect goes through uh, the entire uh, um, uh, uh, range of, of, of jobs in, 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 in the bank. Now at the end of the survey we also asked uh, participants uh, questions 
uh, one question uh, to get at their materialistic values. So they had to answer the question, to what extent do you agree with the following statement, financial success is the primary determinant of social status. So which can be seen as a, a, a proxy for uh, materialistic norms. So we can thus analyze how the, 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 the priming or the, the saliency of their occupational role influences their answers to these questions and also how their answers are related to uh, their honesty. And <clears throat> here you see the response to this, to this uh, question and you can see when the they are induced to think about their occupational role, they're more likely to endorse uh, this statement, uh, this materialistic statement. And also, people who are above median in terms of uh, their responses to this question, they uh, cheat significantly more than people who are below uh, uh, below median in terms of their score in, in endorsement of materialistic values. So suggesting that part of this effect that we observe in our experiment is due to the focus on these materialistic uh, 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 norms uh, or in financial status seeking. So one important question is whether this effect is uh, specific to the banking industry or whether we also see it in other types of professions. So it could simply be that when someone thinks about his or her uh, profession then uh, they become more dishonest and in order to test this we conducted uh, a, the same experiment with uh, people from various other non-banking industries, so 133 employees in total and they come from a broad variety of industry, manufacturing, IT, health, pharma, consulting, public sector, and so on. And uh, many of them, um, the majority of them are actually in the upper and uh, middle management in these uh, companies. So they have an average work experience uh, in the industry of nearly 15 uh, years. So they received the same uh, email uh, invitation uh, to this online survey and again the same questions and they were assigned 50 percent were assigned to the condition where they were asked or prompted to think about their occupation by asking them questions like very similar questions like in which industry are you working since when have you been working in this industry etc so like the the bank employees and then 50% received the same control question as the bank employees about the leisure time. And then they played the, this coin tossing task where they could win again up to 200 uh, uh, US dollars. Now here are the results from these uh, non-banking uh, employees. And what you can see is that they, uh, from this graph, is that they behaved honest already in the control, co uh, dishonest already in the control condition. So in contrast to the bank employees, uh, they cheated quite a lot in the control condition. So, however, as I mentioned at the beginning, a simple comparison of subject pools does not reveal anything about the effect of culture. So what's interesting is how this manipulation of thinking more about your, your uh, profession affects their behavior. And here you see the results from the uh, professional identity condition, so the condition where they were induced to think about their occupation, and you can immediately see that they become more honest actually, but it's not uh, significant, uh, but the cheating rate is substantially lower when they were induced to think about uh, their job. So together I think these pieces, two pieces of evidence suggest, or I believe that strengthen the hypothesis that these uh, scandals that we have observed in the in the, in, the, in the last couple of years, like the LIBOR scandal, foreign uh, currency exchange manipulations, etc., uh, are at least o are also caused by a problematic uh, business uh, culture. So let me uh, conclude. Um, our results suggest, uh, I think that our results suggest that banks should encourage honest behavior 
and thereby restore the public image of the, of the industry by changing the norms that are associated with the workers' occupation, occupational roles. So such a cultural change obviously uh, requires a lot of time and also actions from multiple angles. So let me briefly uh, um, lay out some of those uh, um, approaches that we think might be interesting to, um, um, to take. So, for example, several ex experts and uh, regulators have proposed that bank employees should take a professional oath similar to the Hippocratic oath for uh, physicians. So, such an oath should be uh, supported with regular ethics training to, promo to prompt uh, that bank employees uh, more strongly consider the impact of their behavior on, 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 on others. But this also requires, um, obviously, such an abstract uh, um, uh, oath. Uh, it should not be just on an abstract level. It should be more, also, uh, should be supported with more concrete measures. And I think it's it's necessary to, to conduct in the different departments a detailed analysis of the different work routines that uh, create potential conflicts. Uh, of, of interest with, with respect to the clients and society uh, or wider society in general. And <clears throat> in a second step, they should establish, the entire team basically should establish a common understanding of what type of behaviors are socially acceptable and what type of, of, of behaviors uh, are not. Second, I think that the norm change also requires that the companies verify that their incentive uh, structures are, uh, and compensation plans are well aligned with an honest business culture. So this means two things in, in, in my view, or in our view. First, that uh, financial incentives uh, that reward employees' uh, behavior that is in conflict with clients and wider society's interests should be reduced. And second, incentive scheme can also be used to signal the core values of the, of the or core cultural values of the bank. So this should be re redesigned such that the client satisfaction and also general citizenship behavior are part of the performance targets. Uh, targets. So in this way, the, the firm really signals uh, that they care about um, other uh, issues than just uh, uh, the, the material uh, uh, benefit. So it's simply not credible to preach honest behavior when actually the compensation plans signal that the bank mostly cares about the, the, the material benefits. Now there is also a growing literature in uh, behavioral economics um, suggesting in psycho social psychology suggesting that moral reminders can actually influence uh, ethical uh, behavior and compliance with the honesty norm. So the use of such reminders also again requires that one makes a detailed analysis of the work routines to find out exactly when and where that actually these normative demands can be rendered salient at the right time and place. And for example, one could think that bank employees have to commit with their uh, signature that they act to the best of their knowledge and interest before um, uh, concluding sensitive uh, deals, for example. So similar measures have been uh, used in, uh, successfully been used in, in the domain of tax evasion and also insurance fraud to promote uh, more honest uh, behavior. But obviously uh, the question is, uh, it would be interesting to conduct more research on this topic and see how such reminders can actually be implemented in uh, the context of, uh, of, the, of the banking uh, industry. Finally, there is a large literature in experimental economics and, uh, and, and norm compliance that shows that people are conditionally cooperative. So they condition their behavior on how others behave. 
And um, <clears throat> so if they think that the majority of people behaves dishonest, then they behave, uh, that other people behave dishonest, then they behave dishonest and the opposite way around. So therefore a cultural change can only be implemented if the bank's leadership is actually living up to the uh, proclaimed values. So this means that the bank's management should lead by example by taking symbolic uh, actions of, of uh, symbolic uh, meaning. Um, for instance, you could think of that the top management could voluntarily forego part of their, their uh, bonus payment, for example, in favor of the bank employees or the clients, which would provide a very strong signal that uh, they care uh, uh, for them. So in the end I think there is great potential for future research to analyze the effectiveness of, of these and similar measures to establish a more, uh, uh, to establish a culture of honesty. Thank you very much. Yes? I have a few questions. Uh, first one, is your study sponsored by a third party? Our uh, study is sponsored by the European Research Council and the uh, Gottlieb Duttweiler Institute. Okay. Um, um, I think that the, the, the sample is extremely small uh, in order to, to study that. And I don't see a focus either on investment banking mm -hmm. or in relation to uh, uh, specific activities, nor a relation to countries, and that's uh, quite important, especially Switzerland versus other uh, uh, financial centers. And uh, um, in the conclusion, I haven't seen anything about the HR process, especially recruiting. So, um, with respect to recruiting, um, <coughs> So the results don't suggest that there is a problem in recruiting. If you think of the control group, you saw that most of the employees actually behaved uh, honest. So this is why we focused on, on, this, uh, uh, on this culture aspect. So the main conclusions we draw are based on this uh, culture aspect. But uh, it's important to say here that we do not claim that every bank uh, or um, has a problematic uh, business culture. And neither do we claim that uh, every uh, bank employee uh, behaves dishonest. Actually, the results uh, show uh, the, the, the opposite. And so we just wanted to test whether, basically the hypothesis was to see there are these scandals. So the question is, where do they come from? Do they come, for instance, due to the HR problems that you uh, were thinking of, for example? Or do they come from cultural aspects from the norms etc and we wanted to test with this experiment whether these cultural uh, aspects can have a, or can be a potential explanation for these types of behavior or scandals that we've seen so it's not about generalizing about the entire uh, banking industry that was not the goal of the of this paper and um, <coughs> uh, but sometimes in the press it, it has been uh, uh, picked up differently, the main message of the, of the, of the paper. So it's not, and uh, with respect to the sample size, uh, we're up to 200, uh, if we put them together, um, the, the 128 and the 80 other bankers, it's uh, more than 200 people, and in total we've run around five different experiments, some of them I didn't even show you here, uh, to test different alternative explanations, etc. So in total there, there's several hundreds of people involved in, in this study and in terms of statistical significance, the results that I show you, the results are, 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 are significant. Could you comment please on the, your reading basically of uh, the CFA uh, codes and standards as well? Uh, we discussed that beforehand as well. So if you could uh, give us some of your insights. Obviously, the, uh, it's not part of your research work, but uh, just your interpretation. No, I um, I was I, I did not uh, study the the, the conduct uh, the code of conduct uh, in depth, but I had a look at at, uh, at the handbook, and <coughs> I, what I liked about it is the concreteness of the of the handbook. So it's not just so. In my experience uh, was that basically many banks already have. Um, 
uh, a code of conduct, but it's, it's on a very abstract level. And with the handbook, I actually saw that, uh, that there are very concrete examples uh, for each of the different uh, uh, points. And uh, I thought that's a step in, 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 in definitely in the, in the right direction there. And also that people are, uh, it's part of the education uh, program um, of the CFA. I yes. have two questions, one more technical and one more in general. Um, maybe the technical first, whether you would be able to share test powers and certificate levels. And the second question, more content-wise, is um, were you able to break down or identify any trends in terms of seniority of the people? Um, would um, older, younger people be more trustworthy or, or more honest, so to say? Um, I didn't get with the, you wanted to know the significance levels. Yes, yeah, significance level, five test power. Um, significance level was, uh, I think, 3% um, for the main effect in the only 128, but it goes down to, I think, 1% <coughs> if you have all uh, together. Um, test power, I would have to, to compute again. But um, I can. I can else give you the, the uh, access to the paper and um, uh, to yeah. there you have all the you, statistics. Right. I haven't read it. I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I was not expecting that. <laughs> and the second question was with respect to seniority. So we ran uh, some regressions where we control for age because seniority is correlated with, with age. And so we control holding age constant. We found that the effect was less, so the, the, in terms of cheating, it has no, no difference. But in, in terms of the treatment effect, we found a less pronounced effect for the employees that worked more than 10 years in the banking industry, than, so this is roughly 50% of the sample, than the subjects who entered the banking industry more recently. But there could be uh, several explanations, like that those people are kicked out of the bank or uh, other types of explanation that uh, so it's it's not clear what what this effect is so you could also for instance argue that the people who were uh, worked longer in the banking industry were exposed to a different culture than those who entered uh, the banking industry uh, more recently or so there are many potential explanations for this result but the effect is significantly less uh, strong for the people who have more than 10 years of uh, tenure in our sample. Yes? Uh, first, I want to congratulate that you took up this topic. It's very important. Um, I think the, the incentive structure is one of the main drivers of, of this behavior that we can uh, observe in general, not only in the finance, but probably also in, in, in the pharmacy, for example. Um, and, and obviously, the setup was not uh, uh, such to, to test this, this uh, uh, correlation between uh, uh, these wrong incentives or, or excessive incentives mm -hmm. given by the uh, uh, this, this financial compensation elements. Uh, do you think it would be possible to, 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 to do some further studies to, to, to uh, prove what seems to be evident? But it's quite uh, uh, subjective, of course. Yes, I, I would love to do uh, more studies in, in this direction. We are actually planning to studies on uh, a slightly different topic where people are, are um, we use similar methodology, but people can uh, take risks for others and they might have uh, an incentive, and in some conditions we give them incentive that they take more risk for the others. So that they uh, they profit from the upside, but not from, from, from the downsides to mirror uh, this type of situation and uh, so we are planning to do more work in this uh, direction but it's certainly an interesting uh, question and our study as you mentioned correctly does not really directly say something about incentive structure because it was held constant between uh, the conditions but nevertheless I think it's important also to think about the signaling aspect or the signal that the that an incentive structure conveys about the the, the values of, of, a, of a compensation because the performance target is basically that uh, what people think the bank really cares about and if, if, if there's only short-term profit in there then uh, it obviously conveys the image that this is valued and not um, 
uh, other things like uh, thinking about your uh, long-term client satisfaction or uh, thinking about the society in more more general way. So I think it would be interesting also to run studies and see, for instance, how incentives for good citizenship behavior, for example, a good citizenship award would uh, affect uh, um, uh, honesty beha honest behavior and the culture. Last question, please. Are you aware of any other studies uh, done in, in the same uh, uh, set up in other industries? Um, <coughs> so the one we have done here, but yes, not that's not, not that was no. specific in one industry. That was no, that was not specific. Yeah. So that's also one important thing yeah. to mention here. We do not rule out that in any other industry there is no cultural problem because we, we just collected a broad range of people from various industries. So it's not for this we, one would need to focus on, on uh, and get more data on one specific industry. So it's not, um, <coughs> it's, it's just, we just looked at whether the banking industry stands out from all others. But that would be obviously interesting uh, to, to look at. Uh. Good ones for politicians, that would be interesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, actually, politicians and uh, car dealers, if you look at the general um, um, trust, there are several studies that measure how much do you trust different professions. And uh, car dealers and uh, politicians generally perform uh, even worse than uh, uh, bank employees. <laughs> <laughs> Well, some aspiration, probably. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That was a great presentation.